three weeks ago, um, one uh, early frosty morning, I was going to a meeting at nine o'clock in the morning at Universities of the UK, who are the representative body for uh, most, um, you know, the vast majority of British universities. Uh, and the meeting was about um, their thoughts about figures on student migration. I had with me a, a paper that I printed from their website, which set out their perspective on, um, on student migration. And it's a crowded tube, and I, you know, as, as, as one does in a tube, I was kind of standing there in my own uh, kind of hole. And at about um, Green Park, I became uh, aware that uh, there was somebody standing next to me who kind of very quickly got, got into her bag and she got out of um, you know, the Pen was writing something quite quickly. And I kind of didn't think very much of it, but I thought, oh, that's maybe somebody who's realised they've got to do a birthday card for someone at work or get well soon, you know, quickly, quickly writing something. So I didn't think anything uh, more of it, and I did that thing you do in the gym and kind of went back into my bubble and was thinking about what I had to do in the day and so on. Got talks for circus, doors opened, um, lots of people got off, including this person, and um, just uh, at the moment just getting off, she handed me. Um, two pieces of paper, the two pieces of paper that she'd been writing. Uh, and uh, being um, very British, my immediate thought was, oh my god, I've done something wrong. And she doesn't want to, uh, she doesn't want to kind of tell me, you know, that maybe I've kind of bumped into somebody with my bag, or, you know, horror of horrors, maybe I've not, you know, let people train first. Or maybe there, there was some like, you know, I, I had assumed there was some transgression that I'd, I'd, uh, I'd committed. Um, and uh, yeah, my second thought was, well, maybe she's politely trying to tell me, you know, I've got something on my jacket, you know, maybe I've got, got a mark on my jacket. She said, yeah, do you, do you know, we do know your bag is open. <laughs> anyway, when I sort of got away from my shop, because it's really very unusual, I think you'll agree, to be handed a note by a complete and utter stranger on the tube. Much as I like to think that women give me notes on the tube all the time, particularly <laughs> <laughs> around Valentine's Day. In fact, that's it's the only time in my entire life this has ever happened. <laughs> and this is what she gave me. I don't know if I can read that, I'll read it to you. She's giving me a note. So, do you know how the yeah, awareness yeah. study on students will be used? Are they trying to limit the number of, and the second piece of paper said, the number of international students? Why are they asking for this info, info right now? Sorry to be nosy, I'm just concerned. Uh, kind of remarkable. Kind of a remarkable thing to, 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 to happen to be, to be given that. What, 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 what do you make of that? I'm really interested in your reactions. I had a few reactions. But what, what, what sort of things do you make of that? name on it to contact her. No, 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 no. She just she wrote the thing and she went. Well, I think it's good she gave it to you rather than someone else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Maybe she, maybe she didn't give this name to, to all sorts of people. It was just a lucky hit that I happened to have a little bit of professional responsibility in this. In this in she this knew area. who you were. Do you think? I, see, I, I think I think that's unlikely. No, I actually knew who you were. Hmm. Well, I'm flattering though that may be. I don't, I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah. Well, just the universities are being told to monitor much more closely. Um, uh, overseas students and whether they've uh, finished their courses and got to the end of um, their visa and uh, you know if they haven't submitted why they haven't really renewed their visa so she's probably being hassled by somebody yeah. who's being hassled to hassle her yeah. As yeah. As, judging by my experience yeah yeah and it's lucky it's a public document that on the website because if it was a confidential document that would have been featured Absolutely, and I wouldn't be standing here now. You're quite right. I'd be, uh, I'd be in the tower or something. Yeah, you're quite, quite right. Um, Unless you had a bag with M and S on it. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, as, we'll, as we'll get onto in this presentation, um, if I was to have a bag with M and S written on it, I really wouldn't have listened to anything I've been saying for the last uh, the last three years. Uh, I'm probably the last person in this entire room to ever have a bag with M and S on it. But um, no, I th I suspect that. Uh, she saw that I had this thing from the University of UK website, which is about student migration, and she thought there's someone who, who knows something about the subject. I'd be surprised if she knew my role. Because um, I think if she knew my role, she might have given a contact and said, you know, I'd like you to sort of take this forward. But she, I've got no contact, so <laughs> in fact, I told this story to our, um, 
uh, the UK Assistant Authority's head of communications, and he said, "Well, let's find this person. Let's kind of, let's kind of put something on the, you know, on, on Twitter or something to find them." And I'm going like, "That's that's not that's not." What I take the story actually is a bit of a pity she didn't leave contact because I could have talked her through it. But more importantly, the main thing I, I I take from it is that I think it's kind of unusual to be in a public space and for someone to um, to reach out like that. And to an expressive view uh, on something which is clearly so personal. Now, I think in this sort of world of, 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 uh, of post-truth and people writing articles about death of statistics, I think it's a really fantastic reminder that actually what we do, the official statistics section, uh, the UK Statistics Authority, it really matters. And it matters profoundly, not just to us inside our world, but it matters to the public. And that's really going to be the theme of, 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 of my presentation. But what we do matters, and the changes I'm going to describe uh, are really going to help uh, help with that. So let me um, go back to the uh, opening uh, question: How can the Office for Statistics Regulation enhance confidence in, in a world that's changing? So in that question, there are two components: there's a changing world, and there's the Office for Statistics Regulation. So I'm going to spend about a minute on the changing world and quite a lot of time on the Office of Statistics Regulation. And that's because I think the changing world is pretty familiar. Uh, this is sort of much talked about in the statistical community. And I sort of summarise it as, um, as every day goes by, it becomes more evident that we're in a world of abundant data. Uh, digitally collected, uh, mutely connect collected, uh, it's everywhere. Uh, its ease of collection means that um, uh, lots of the effort that has in the past gone into collection uh, is, 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 is no longer necessary. It enables uh, a world of much richer um, sourcing of statistics. This is the kind of um, almost the nirvana that you'll hear the ONS talking about a lot of, of rich administrative data uh, feeding into statistics. Um, I think that means uh, a proliferation of sources. Uh, I think it's um, potentially means that the idea of official statistics might uh, be, uh, if they ever had a monopoly, much less of a monopoly because it's so easy for people to create statistics. Um, and I think that that leads us to something which, which is uh, kind of profoundly important, which is that um, data, we live in a world where data is a, is a central part of discourse. Uh, and um, I, I suppose the famous illustration of that would be the referendum. Um, it's the first time I can uh, ever remember uh, oh, the, the key campaigning slogan uh, of one of the campaigning entities having a number in it. Now, there's lots of disputes as to what, what the, mean, the number meant and how it was used, but it was a number. There was a sense that using a, a factoid was a way of, um, of, of uh, engaging with the public. Now, my second illustration of that is Match of the Day. I don't know how many of you watch Match of the Day. I, actually, I don't, but I was watching it the other, the other week and on Sunday morning when I had the repeat, and I noticed that whenever they were talking about a play, Flashed up a little image of the player at the bottom right of the, the corner of the screen, and like kind of all these facts, you know, like how far the player had run, and you know their average speed, and all of this kind of like, which you know, effectively I think meaningless uh, information, meaningless unless you can have comparative reference for, for lots of other players. Um, but this sort of sense that well, if you've got some data, you can just use it and deploy it. I think that's the world that we're in, and I think it's a factor in what is people call post truth. And I'm not going to say much about post truth. Um, but I, I suppose um, my reflection is, in a world where data is everywhere, there's a, there's a sort of debasing of the currency that, uh, that, that, that might be going on. So that's the changing world. Um, I'm going to talk now about the Office for Statistics Regulation and explain uh, why the Office has been created and what we do. Starts with the critique, and the critique is, is uh, goes something like this, uh, and it's a critique that was um, crystallised in the Bean Review of Economic Statistics, Chapter 5 of, of that review, but by no means kind of invented by Charlie Bean. He was channeling what he saw and what he heard from a wide range of sources. The critique uh, goes like this. Firstly, uh, the, uh, the UK Statistics Authority has, a, has had a confused role and identity. The ONS the executive arm of the authority has got a very clear identity, a very strong brand, um, clearly, clearly visible. But the authority, um, as both the kind of 
owner, the governor of the ONS, but also this regulatory function, has been a bit confusing and not quite clear whether the, the, the different roles begin. So that was one um, critique. And it's really nicely illustrated by some of the exchanges of letters you might see on our website, where uh, I might say to John Pullinger, who's the national statistician, dear John Pullinger, you've been a naughty national statistician. And he will write back and say, dear Director General for Regulation, I'm sorry, I promise I won't do it again. It's that, that, that kind of exchange of letters. And the weird thing is, it's both on exactly the same headed note paper, which I think must convey to the outside world this kind of really weird schizophrenia an organisation writing to itself uh, in that way. So it's a confusing uh, identity. To some extent, that's a consequence of the Act of uh, 2008, which created the authority. There are some other things in the critique which are less embedded in the Act and more about the way the function has been carried out. Firstly, that the function hasn't been very visible. Uh, secondly, it's not been um, very systemic. If you look at the assessment reports that the uh, uh, authority has produced as a regulator, there's about 330 of them, all in, in a list, and they're kind of organised chronologically, and you might jump from uh, an assessment report about an inflation index, to an assessment report about accident and emergency waiting times, to an assessment report about uh, sustainable development in indicators, and so on. I find a very episodic um, and, and, and not very um, systemic um, uh, approach. It's difficult to see the kind of join between all those various uh, reports. And then thirdly, um, insufficiently visible and insufficiently systemic, also we, uh, or Charlie Bean felt that we were um, insufficiently focused on quality and innovation. And I should say that uh, I'm not uh, defensive about those critiques. I think those are fair critiques. I think they gave us the platform for the changes that I'm going to describe. Uh, those changes have four themes, um, which I've listed there, and I'll go through each of those into separate identity, uh, re-emphasising that statistics are a public asset, uh, a core purpose uh, around trustworthiness, quality and value, uh, and uh, reaching out beyond official statistics in terms of so let me go through each of those in turn, and just before I do so, there are four photographs that I'm going to use as I talk through this, and um, um, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll have relevance at each point. The first is a photograph of a, a walled garden, kind of beautiful but enclosed and private. Uh, the second is a photograph of a kind of production line conveyor belt, lots of people with their heads down, focused on the specific task they have in this chain, but not really looking outwards. Uh, the third, as someone who's doing a traffic count um, with a, a, a clipboard. And the fourth being a sort of automatic um, mute collection of data by the sensor. And those photographs will have relevance as I go through. Let me start with the first theme then. We will have a clearly separate uh, identity and role. And um, when we say separate, it's visibly separate from the production of statistics. So we're going to move from, or have moved now because we've launched, from a world where you had a big thing called the Office for National Statistics, and then within the UK Statistics Authority, uh, a regulatory function, to separating out the regulatory function. And that means that the authority now has two clear separate arms. An executive office which produces statistics, uh, headed by John Pullinger, and an executive office that um, regular statistics headed by me. I should say that um, two, two, uh, two caveats uh, about this. Firstly, it's not remotely drawn to scale. Uh, even, even in my wildest dreams of my resource base, uh, if you were drawing those things to scale, uh, we wouldn't be that big. So that's about 3,000 people, and that's fewer than 25, and that's about 40. So those 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 bolts aren't scale, but actually it's worse than that because this picture makes it look as though the UK statistical system has these, these these two very big limbs and it's got this kind of uh, small piece there. Actually, that's the biggest by far um, of the um, a thousand national statistics. Uh, only about a third are produced by ONS and two thirds are produced by other statistical producers. Uh, default administrations, uh, white. 
all of those interactions are mediated by the code of practice for official statistics, which I'll come on to as we talk. So that's the clearly separate identity. Obviously, very happy to take questions about that. Uh, the second theme in building an office for statistics regulation was to say, well, what is the what is the uh, public good that we exist to enhance? And the public good that we exist to enhance is that statistics are a public asset. Uh, and this is where the image of a walled garden comes in. Because the thing about walled gardens is that they are you know, really beautiful and perfect and manicured and uh, rather lovely places, and they're closed off. And I think that there has been a danger in the way that uh, the code of practice has operated uh, and um, I and my colleagues in the past have regulated statistics, that we kind of preserve this kind of isolated notion of statistics without really thinking about the public that those statistics serve. Um, so we definitely want to move away from the walled garden uh, or, 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 or perhaps to make that door much, much bigger so more people can, 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 can get in. When we say statistics are, are, are a public <coughs> asset, um, like any asset, um, the uh, the value of the asset can be harmed. This is true of physical assets and also an intangible asset like a statistic. The value of, of any asset can be harmed by poor quality, uh, simply that it's not um, designed, doing the job it's designed to, and mm -hmm. that uh, risk is very evident in some statistics, as we would all know there are some poor quality statistics. Um, the value of an asset can also be harmed by obsolescence. It did do a good job once, but it no longer does a good job. And actually, if you look at the Bean review of economic statistics, that's kind of one of the charges against the UK's economic statistics. Quite good at measuring the economy as it was, less good at measuring the economy as it is and is becoming. Um, so obsolescence is a, is a, is a, a way that um, value can be harmed. Uh, but of course, also misuse. An asset can be misused and that damages its quality. You can imagine that with a physical asset. It's also true of statistics. And I would say that um, over time, probably it's this misuse problem which is becoming more and more evident in, 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 in public life. So when we say statistics are a public asset, probably misuse is becoming the bigger uh, of these three sources of, of harm. Now, so far, I'm talking about an Office for Statistics Regulation. And uh, this is an account that any regulator would recognise. There's a public good that you exist to uphold, and there's a series of harms that you exist to mitigate. We're the same. Public good, you know, statistics there for the public to help them understand the world, um, and a series of harms. And at this point, in any standard regulatory presentation, the presenter would then say, and here are my enforcement tools for, uh, for achieving the mitigation of those harms. So I've got those on this next slide. The whole range of our enforcement tools. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, all of our enforcement tools are up right there. Um, well, what about naming and shame? Well, now, now, but, yeah, you've, 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 <coughs> Woody, you're as always way ahead of me. Uh, that's exactly uh, where we're going to go. So, there are no, if you look at the act, there are no teeth. Uh, I cannot find anyone. Uh, I can't um, compel anybody to produce statistics. I can't prevent anybody from producing statistics. Uh, much as I'd love to, I can't strike anybody off from practicing as a, as, a, as a statistician. But I think, actually, we have a range of what you might call soft powers, which are, if anything, more effective than those hard judicial uh, powers, which always get kind of contested and, and, and debated. We have a range of soft powers. And in some ways, the most important of those is, is the code of practice. Because what the code of practice does is it kind of encodes the behaviours expected of statisticians uh, in the practice of producing statistics. And if you read it, it's very much a behavioural, it's a set of behaviours. Uh, there are a couple of specific things like a 930 release, but mostly it's a describing set of behaviours. And the thing which is really striking about it is that if you go out across the GSS, across the official statistics community, this document is extremely well known, well respected. Um, I've spoken in other presentations about seeing uh, uh, seeing people with coffee, copies with coffee stains on, and they're like the coffee stains of integrity. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good, well respected document. The second of our soft powers is the power to give or take away a brand. 
Now, if this code really exists <coughs> to help guide statisticians, this helps to guide users. Because what it does is it, it, it um, conveys to users uh, that the statistics that they are um, using for processing uh, meet the highest standards. And I think of it as being like uh, the fair trade uh, logo or, or um, one of those kind of things you get on eggs where they say the eggs are free range. Basically, what it, what it reflects is a promise being made by the producer that they will act in certain ways and they have acted in certain ways. Um, so that national statistics designation is really important, and it's powerful, it's powerful. We saw this most graphically when we removed it from crime statistics. Um, the, the police really cared about it, and uh, both in Scotland and in England and Wales, the removal has produced a really significant change in, in, in and improvement in reporting practices. So it's a soft power, but it's really powerful. And the third thing is Woody's point, uh, which is the next one, is, which is that we have this power to name and shame. And this is just one example on NHS funding claims. Um, this capacity to say when we see misuse or poor dissemination of statistics. And uh, that again is respected. And I think those of you who are within the GSS will attest to. Um, Recognizing that you don't want to receive these kind of these kind of uh, public uh, uh, shaming, and then you do lots of sensible things to to, to protect your department from this. And the final um, uh, power is the power to convene, to bring people together, uh, to uh, uh, create roundtables and events. And I know that some of you have attended some of our health events, which I think are very good examples of that power to convene. So, with the avoidance of doubt, if it's for statistics regulation. Um, has a full range of really effective soft powers, and there is nothing in this which is me campaigning for. I wouldn't want tougher enforcement powers because I just don't think they'd work that effectively. So that's um, the uh, public uh, good and the, and the powers of the office. Uh, let me just say something about um, our kind of underpinning philosophy. And I think it comes down to being concerned that statistics, the production of statistics, should never be like that. And I think it quite often is. I think it quite often is a production chain uh, which has, uh, where people do things because that's the way they've been done to crank the handle, not thinking about what outcomes they're looking to achieve. We define those outcomes, and you'll hear us use these, this, this form of words uh, relentlessly, uh, is that statistics should be trustworthy, high quality, and high value. And these aren't just sort of general words that we sort of plucked at random from a kind of you know, nice sounding word generator. They've got really, really um, profound meanings. Trustworthy uh, is, uh, is that the statistics are produced free from vested interest and based on the best professional judgment. In other words, that these, this is ways that the producer is signaling to their users, users again being central focus, signaling to their users that they have acted in ways which have been free from the kind of interventions that would make the statistics questionable. So trustworthiness, I think of trustworthiness as being the bedrock. It's like the you know, bottom of the Maslow's hierarchy. If you haven't got that, then you've got nothing. Uh, not enough on its own. We also need to see quality. Uh, and of course, there's lots of kind of dimensions of quality, and the code of practice uh, uh, brings those out. But at a kind of conceptual level, it's that the statistics are the best available estimates of what they purport to measure and they're not materially misleading. And that's kind of what we always look for with the statistics. Best available estimate and not materially misleading. And the third, and in our view, the most important is that the, the statistics must be publicly valuable. Uh, they're not just collections of interesting numbers or data. It's not like an open data release, but the statistics generate insight and that they answer questions that people want to uh, address. So those are our, our sort of foundational principles, if you will. We are refocusing all of our work um, to address that. So if you were to look at one of our recent assessment reports, um, the assessment reports are really refocused really around strategic value. When we say strategic value, like how are these helping users make sense of the world? Um, and in fact, we um, uh, recently suspended the designation as national statistic of a set of statistics. Um, not because of quality concerns, but because we thought that was not enough to demonstrate the value to the public of these statistics. 
Um, some of you I know will be familiar with our work looking at broader themes, looking at health statistics in the round, not just the whole succession of individual outputs. Um, we are looking very much to celebrate excellence. Uh, and uh, finally, and I'll come on to this in the next section, we're looking to refresh the game of practice. So that's all about moving a, a notion of what statistics are for from being a production line to being something which is creating um, a sense in the public of trustworthiness, quality, and value. The final thing we're doing is thinking quite hard about uh, the scope of our, um, of our work. And the phrase we use is that our scope will be official statistics, we want our reach to be wider. And that's because there's much greater use in this abundant data world of different kinds of data. Uh, the, this this uh, sense of official statistics no longer having a kind of unique uh, a unique role, a much, much richer kind of um, ecosystem. Um, so what we're going to do is um, advocate the code's core principles, code practice core principles to uh, public bodies as best practice they should follow, regardless of whether they define what they produce as official statistics or not. And secondly, we're going to update the code um, to em so emphasize trustworthiness and <coughs> value. Some of you may already have been involved in some uh, workshops and focus groups around that. Let me illustrate that with a picture. <coughs> the current world, the world that we are moving from, is a world that apparently looks quite clear, a clear hard boundary. National statistics and official statistics, they're in our scope, and everything else isn't in our scope. You know, that, that's sort of quite, uh, uh, quite clear, but like lots of things which are apparently quite clear, it's sort of, um, it's a bit pointless. Because we all know that there's all sorts of other things going on. Uh, we know that government is um, publishing a lot of sort of entity level and unit level data. Um, open data or management information, really, really good examples of things which are published. They're not called official statistics, uh, but they uh, are in the public domain. Um, government also produces a lot of uh, secondary analysis, linked or research based data or ad hoc outputs. Again, it's very variable whether those things are called official statistics, and we also have lots of things produced by non-government bodies which then get into public uh, discourse. Um, so whilst this has a seductive kind of simplicity to it, it's not really very helpful for the public. And I can imagine the public, I remember the public listening to me saying, well, you know, it's all statistics, isn't it? And what are these kind of different uh, uh, divisions? And moreover, we increasingly comment on things in these spaces, um, but without a very clear frame of reference to help us do it. So if you look at our correspondence, you know, when we made these public name and shame time interventions, um, we're quite often talking about things which are here rather than there. Um, and uh, so it's a little bit like, you know, as the world changes, we need to change our, our sense of scope. So how are we going to change our scope um, is, uh, is like this. The code of practice will retain at its heart a focus on national statistics and other official statistics. That will remain um, a place where we expect to see full compliance with the code of practice. Um, but because of this sort of multi multifarious variated world, um, we're not going to kind of create a hard division. And indeed, some of these other things, uh, at the margins, we will say, actually, those are official statistics too, and the whole code should apply. And there are really good guidance from John Pullinger actually on exactly this question when uh, secondary analysis or um, uh, entity level data should be recognised as official statistics. And we'll publish kind of clear uh, sense of when we will deem something ourselves to be um, entirely within that uh, scope. Uh, we would also um, be very happy for non government bodies to comply with the code voluntarily so that they would. And, and there are examples of third sector organisations who are active. I think more importantly, um, that this, this kind of hard line is really a bit fuzzy, um, because if a member of the public, they'll see something coming out, uh, a minister uh, using data in discourse, and I think they wouldn't want to say, oh, well, I, I, I don't expect them to do such a clear job with that, because it's not really official statistics. I don't think that's a fair thing to expect the public to say. So what we um, will also advocate is this wider reach 
to say that actually the core principles of the code can apply in these spaces in a flexible way. Specific requirements in the core, principles flexibly applied outside that. So that you get to a world where a department, let's say MOD or, or DFE, can say that they are um, deploying the principles of the code um, in, a, in a very open way around some of their other releases without specifying full compliance with the code. And I think that creates a, a really simple way of thinking about it, which is you've got a, you've got a kind of a core, which is official national statistics, and then flexible principles which apply more widely. And of course, those flexible principles are that the statistics should be trustworthy, high quality, and like that. And that's what the code will say. The code will say some high level principles which we think you should all um, adopt and adopt in a, in, a, in a flexible way to suit your needs uh, for different kinds of releases. Um, and then there's a core which will be. <coughs> That's our uh, way of moving from a kind of hard boundary world into a much more variegated world. And in a sense, it's, uh, it's really reflecting this shift from a, a kind of world where there's this sort of unique data collection activity to one where data is kind of quite multivariate and multi source. So that's a very, very quick summary of this new Office for Statistics regulation. A clearly separate identity, focused on standing up for public value, uh, with a much more systemic focus, and above all, advocating for the public, trustworthy, high quality, high value statistics. And let me just close by going back to where I, I began the, the, the post it notes. Um, post it notes which said that actually this stuff really matters. It's not, uh, it's not just a little kind of private world that we in the official statistics section care about. It really matters to the public. Uh, there was an event here on Post Truth uh, a couple of weeks ago. Tracy Brown from Sense About Science said this, which I thought was a fantastic, um, fantastic quote. She said, so far from living in a post-truth world where people don't care about truth, she said, we're actually surrounded by examples of people search for evidence and truth. And she had some small examples of, sort of individuals who wanted to find out about what was um, safe for them in terms of um, an operation they have to do, and then really big examples like the, the campaign of the, the, the Hillsborough families. You know, their, their you know, 20 year story is nothing other than a, a search for the truth. They're certainly not people who would say the truth doesn't matter anymore. And I think that what Tracy captured there, we should all take to heart, because in a sense, if this stuff still matters, it's our job as the official statistics regulation to help people in, in, in their search for evidence of truth. And I think more broadly, for the official statistics community that we're all a part of, uh, the, uh, it's our job to help them on, on that journey. And that's really kind of what underpins um, everything that we uh, are all about. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I've introduced you to the official statistics uh, office for, for um, statistics regulation, and I've, I've also I've given you a sense of the kind of ambition and the, um, the sort of philosophy that underpins how we're doing our work.